Today we're going to wrap up this important series, as, as you have heard, and we've, we've called it Force of Habit because it's a reminder how the habits that we hold and that hold us have incredible force in our lives, don't they? The things that we uncritically just find ourselves doing because they're sort of automatic reflexes. They're ingrained in us, right? That's why Aristotle, we've been quoting it every week, he said, you know, we are what we repeatedly do. That's the force of a habit. Show me your habits, I show you your life, right? And so that's why it's important to recognize that. And also then we immediately can say to ourselves, if we're honest, man, some of the habits that can creep into our lives are really bad for us. They're bad for our relationship with God, they make it harder to connect to him. They're, they're not helping the relationships we have with other people. They make our outlook on life sometimes negative. They suck life and energy and money and all that stuff away from Some of our habits are just taking us in a direction we don't really want to go and to be. And so I think it's important to kind of get out of the, this sort of theoretical realm. And I just want to invite you, as we get ready to delve in, to really just ask yourself this question, what, what would someone who really knows you very, very well, someone, maybe those who love you the most and are closest to you, what would they say is the habit they really would hope you'd be working on? You know? Be honest. What's that, what's that thing? Something that's hurting you or holding you back. And then, and then hear the word of the Lord from Hebrews 12, which reminds us that we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And so therefore, it says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles so that we can run with perseverance the race that is out in front of us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. People of faith need to know and believe that however deeply ingrained something is into our life, if it's leading us away from the wholeness and fullness that God intends for us, it can be, with his power, thrown off. It really can. That's the hope of the good news of Jesus. And if habits were easy to throw off, none of us would have any. It's not easy. The challenges are real. But we've been also clinging to the truth of the promise of Scripture in 2 Peter 1 that says, by his divine power, in other words, from outside our own efforts, there's another power at play that can help us. And the good news is that God has given it to us. He's given us everything we need for living a godly life. And how can we receive all of this? By coming to know him, Jesus Christ. That's how, by coming to know Jesus, the one who called himself to the means of his marvelous glory and his excellence. A relationship with Jesus is key because that's when we get away from, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just do all this on my own strength. I'm going to pull up my own pants and, and, and buckle my own bootstraps and I'm going to do all this. And what we end up with then is almost always just surface level changes. We've changed our behavior on the outside, but we're still the same person on the inside. And what we're invited to do is to literally change from the inside out, to become a new person, to like literally be transformed, to learn to recognize that what we call bad habits are very often just symptoms of stuff that's going on down inside of us. The thing beneath the thing is what needs the attention of Jesus. And so, friends, we humbly remember, okay, there is a divine power that can be at work in my life, and I invite Jesus into the deepest places where the habits form, where the hurt is, where the habits start, so he can truly bring help and healing to an open heart like that, so we can be changed from the inside out. That's a beautiful thing, and that's what we're clinging to. That's... That's what I hope this series has helped you be able to feel like you're moving forward on in your walk with God, wherever you are today. One last time, I'll put the number on the screen and the word. You can text the word habit to the number on the screen, and that's just our way of staying in touch. Because this is heavy. This takes homework. So during the week, we'll send you a couple encouragement and reminders, uh, some scripture, and just some positive stuff to kind of just say, oh yeah, I'm working on that this week. So there it is. Text the word habit there. Today, we want to give some biblical teaching and some practical help, I think you're really going to like, um, about two particular bad habits that in my estimation have spiraled out of control 
especially during this whole COVID thing where we've been experiencing together. It's almost epidemic. I think if the CDC tracked these things, they would say, oh my gosh, it's epidemic, it's contagious, it's spreading everywhere, everyone's got this going. That's what they would say. You want to you take, take a guess what I'm talking about? Anybody? Maybe some of you know already. I'm talking about worry and complaining. And they're kind of cousins, but worry and complaining. Now, some of you are like, oh, good, because uh, the person I came with, man, they really, they really need this. But, you know, there, there, are, there are some of the habits we've talked about, lust, anger, this kind of thing, that are so clearly bad for us. Last week, Brian Head Welch stood up here and sat up here and had the courage to be transparent and talk about his life of sex and drugs and debauchery. And it's easy to look and say, now that's a bad habit. What's less easy to do is to identify some of the things that are almost kind of socially acceptable, you know, because they don't look so bad on the outside. They're so common that they don't look like they would harm us, but they have absolutely the power to cripple us and hollow us out on the inside. And that's what worry does. That's what complaining can do for us. I want to say something. I'll probably say it kind of clumsily, but we've said it many times, and I want to try to say it again, and that is we don't want to give the impression that every kind of mental health issue is exactly the same. We don't want to give the impression that it's a quick little easy fix, and I say a prayer, and it's done. I don't want to pretend that. I do want to say, I think what we're going to say today is hugely important, and that the spiritual dimension that we're going to talk about is, is vital, but also that this is a it's big and it, it involves our, our emotional and our physical and other dimensions of our life and that if you find yourself still struggling after we've talked about and implemented the things we're talking about, it may be that you need to utilize some of the other resources that God puts at our disposal as well, like maybe a really good trained counselor, maybe even medication, other things that might be a part of what God intends for your wholeness. But what we're going to share today is about the epidemic of worry and complaining that is crippling all of us. I mean, if you if I mean you have to admit, right? How many of you would say you worry a little more now than you did before March of 2020? How many would say that's the case? Okay, I'm looking at a room with a lot of hands up. How many would say you've heard a lot more complaining in the culture, huh? If you have your finger on the pulse of the society around us, it's like we are all chronic warriors and complainers and we all know how to really express who's wrong, who's an idiot, what's wrong and how, how the world's going to hell in a handbasket and everyone's stupid and we're, we're in this toxic soup uh, of just nonstop complaining and it's really affecting our hearts and souls and we want to offer some hope and a path out and that's why I'm so glad to introduce to you another friend this week and her name is Mindy Caliguire. I want to introduce her to you. Um, Mindy, uh, let me put it this way. When I had my cataract problem a while back, who did I go to? An eye doctor. When I had a tooth problem, I went to a dentist. I have a financial question, I go to a financial expert. I'm so glad in a time like the one we're living in right now, that there are people like Mindy that you can go to to say, I got a question about my soul. Not that she's kind of a soul expert, if you will. She helps us know how to really just be with God in a really beautiful way. She's so down to earth, and I just I love and respect her. She, she's the co-founder and president of a place called Soul Care, which is about spiritual formation. And she's also, at the same time, uh, in executive leadership at Glue, which is a kind of fast-growing uh, tech company, which delves into big data analytics. So it's a a real interesting mix that she is. Uh, I serve on a board with her um, for Stadia Church Planting, and I love what she brings to it. She, she's been all over the world. She speaks everywhere. She's written all these books. You can follow her on Instagram, but mostly she's my friend, and I want her to be your friend. So will you welcome my friend, Mindy Caliguire? Come on, Mindy. All right. Well, hey. Here we are. Hey, Very you fun. have much less hair and fewer tattoos than the last guest. I, I did um, go and Google your... You don't look anything <laughs> like Brian. <laughs> I was like, oh man, you guys are going to be pretty disappointed. <laughs> no, we, we won't be, but welcome back to Baltimore. <laughs> well, thanks. It's good to be here. Yeah. I love Baltimore. As we say around here, Balmer. I don't know if okay. I'm saying it quite correctly, but at least I know what it should sound like. Yeah. 
I'm so happy that you're meeting our my mountain friends. I love it when two of my friends connect. So my yeah. mountain family. Yeah, and, and absolutely. Mindy. So let's jump right in. Yeah. One of the crazy things about Mindy right now is that you've been digging into the realm of neuroscience. Yes, I have. And trying I'm, to understand like what's going on here, and and yet it turns out that the Bible's been saying a lot of this stuff for a long time. What? what that's been one of the things that's been most exciting for me, having studied the Bible for so many years and been in ministry settings and things like that, but to realize now that the findings in neuroscience and around this idea of neuroplasticity that we'll get into in a minute are things that, if we follow the teachings of the scriptures, are things that are exactly align with how God has been advising us to flourish as humans for a very long time. And so, uh, yeah, neuroscience really comes into the realm of the brain and the mind and how are those two things related and so everything about the soul you know hinges on what is going on in the in the brain and the mind and those are two separate things but they're kind of close together so unpack it a little more what are you talking about it's like what neuroscience what what i sign up for here so what last the week we have <laughs> yeah. tattoos and long hair and now we're talking about neuroscience, neuroscience. so guys yeah okay. put I, on your thinking caps for a minute so yeah like what 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 about i mean the the bible says simply we're fearfully and wonderfully made and yet when you when you dive into this stuff it's like yeah wow the it's mind a great illustration. yeah the mind the brain is so powerful like it's so much stronger than, like they say, it holds enough data is like the same amount as the Library of Congress is what any one person's brain holds. They say the entire library of Netflix movies could be in your brain. Your brain can hold all that. The computational speed, the speed at which you make decisions, you observe things, you track things, all of that is happening without really any thoughtfulness on your part, and your brain is constantly at work. In fact, the whole auto nervous, automatic nervous system that's sort of your cerebellum in the back of the brain, it's actually running everything. Your breathing patterns, your, uh, your heartbeat, keeping that going, even moderating your temperature ongoing, whether you're in you're the deep south. You're not thinking about it. Your brain's just doing that like a refrigerator you're, motor. This you're thing. up in Alaska, anywhere you are, any environment, your brain is constantly monitoring and causing your temperature to be optimized. That's without you even thinking about it, right? So all of those things show us, it's just the scratching the bare surface of how our brains are so powerful. They're so phenomenal. They're fast. They're powerful. They do all kinds of things that we don't even think about. Mm -hmm. But you know, there's a, there's a, I live in Boulder, Colorado, which I love Baltimore, but Boulder's pretty awesome. <laughs> and there was a time recently that I was driving down one of the main highways and I didn't really think I was much of a sports car person, but I actually, this car went flying past me and I thought, my goodness, what on earth is that? And so I kind of followed it a little bit and I'm in my little Ford Edge, right? I'm like clunking along trying to keep up with this thing. And it was, you can see the picture, it was psychedelic and Okay, yes. so you took this picture while you're driving. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell Go anybody. And her and then be don't don't okay. tell anybody. <laughs> I mean, come on. Isn't that a really a pretty, pretty cool crazy car? car? So it was did. like this psychedelic sports car. I had no idea what kind it was. And I was like, I've got to figure out what that is. So yes, I pulled up behind it, found out a way to take a picture. Don't tell anyone. And then I, uh, and I went home and, and Googled the thing. And turns out, does anyone know what kind of car that is? Someone said yes, yeah. yes. I heard two or three people. This is a McLaren. And if you've got nothing better to do with about $250,000 minimum, Whoa. you might want to go get one. Uh, but yeah, this is another one. But if you think about it, like these are what your brain kind of is like. Your brain designed by God is meant to move fast and be able to do really cool stuff at very high speeds. And that's how that's how sort of we're made in the image of God. We are brought into the world in that way. And your brain might be like that orange one. I think you liked that one, right? Yeah, the orange one's mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's Ben's brain. <laughs> I like the psychedelic one myself. I think that's kind of cool. Yours might be a Porsche or some other fancy car. But the thing about neuroplasticity is that our brains actually change over time. The mind due to a force of habit, can start to lay down new neural networks, new pathways. This can work in both really positive ways and negative ways. Let's think about it in the positive for a moment. 
Um, the idea of driving a car, so we're sticking with the cars idea here. Does anybody remember what it was like to learn to drive? Right? Like you have to work really hard to remember to I put remember the blinker what it was like on. I teach my kids. Right? Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah, me too. That, that's, that's scary. That's scary. Awkward. Talk about worry and complaining. Yeah. <laughs> but you're trying to figure out, like, especially if there's a clutch, the clutch days, remember? Oh, it's like, man. Okay, how, oh my goodness, this is so hard at first. It's so hard. And you're learning the rules of the road, you're learning which how to operate the, blinker, the car. Which ones the, yeah. yeah, it's like when you get a rental car and you don't know which way it is. It's really tricky to learn to drive. But once you learn, your brain sort of outsources the actual driving to... You're not sitting there thinking anymore. You don't. You can like, be oh, talking on the phone. Oh, there's a red light. Which foot do I put on the... Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes you can drive from one place to another and not even remember it. You get to your destination. You're like, wait, did I, what, what? Because your brain outsources it to the automatic nervous system. You're actually checking in with your mirrors. You know you what you're doing. It. Would you say you learned it kind of? Well, it but it's... become a habit of sorts. It's a habit. It becomes habituated. It's a habituated okay. process. And it shows you how powerful the brain is. Now, that can happen for great good because it's actually convenient to be able to do other things instead of having to think about your blinkers all the time. But the same thing can happen with negative thoughts. And we can be just as habituated to a scowl on our face when we disagree with what somebody's saying. We can be just as habituated to complaining when we don't like what's going on around us, to worry. And all those things can be just as automated mm. or they feel as automated as learning to drive. Mm. And when that happens, the actual structures in the brain start to change. They do all this brain imaging now. Now, this is not real brain imaging, but if you think about it, a lot of times we might look fine on the outside, but instead of driving a McLaren, our brain might be like a beat up VW, right? Your brain might be looking like <laughs> There's this. There's your brain. <laughs> or it could look even worse if it really falls into disrepair. Now, this is my favorite one. Your brain could be like this tonight. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. not even driving anymore. It's off in the field. There's grass growing up around it. But the truth is we must steward this incredible, valuable treasure of the mind and the brain that holds the functioning of the mind. And when we do... Uh, it, it opens us up to great good and great, great harm. Uh, one of the things that I think w we're going to talk about is just this fact that there's a gap between an impulse yeah. and our response Actual to decision, it. Actual decision, right? Yeah. A lot of so times, talk about yeah. that. How does that work? So, I mean, that's, that's, um, that's kind of funny, you know, to see the VWs up yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. And that's my brain or whatever. But it's kind of sobering in a way if, if, if it's true that God created our minds with this kind of neuro, neuroplasticity mm -hmm. to learn and then to, to be filled enough with him in the way that we were to flourish to know that we're stuck with these bad habits. So maybe, maybe you can talk to us a little bit about are, are you saying we don't have any choice in the matter? Uh, we, we're just like... We're hopelessly bound to the habits, the neural patterns in our brain. Uh, that's what you're not, it's not what you're saying. Not at all. And I think that's the, the great beauty of what's coming in the realm of neuroscience and understanding the brain that starts to point us back to the way of Jesus and the way God has made available to us. Because we're not victims of whatever habitual things have led us up to our current way of life. There is a way of our functioning that we can open ourselves up to a new path, to a new thought, to a new neural pathway that might be formed, that we start to, that, that's what's so cool about this idea of a force of habit. There's a negative idea of a force of habit that, oh, we just fall into it. But habits are so powerful that when we start to reorient ourselves intentionally with God's help, and that's a big part of it, is with God's help, how do we start forming new habits? How do we start forming the kind of habits that, that recreate the McLaren <laughs> instead of the beat-up VW? At the heart of the gospel <laughs> is the message that you can change. You are, you are not who you need to be at this moment, that there's a power of the gospel. And yes. neuroscience is telling us yes. there's a four-second gap or whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. from when I think, oh, here comes this thing, and I've got to respond a certain way, and it says, no, you don't. Which I think is, there's like a gap, and that little gap is where the Holy Spirit comes into our minds, into our lives, yeah. where we have an option, we have a choice we invite to choose a different path. Yeah, most of us are not aware, it's almost imperceptible, 
the, when you have a, a reaction, you, you have an impulse, a desire to do something, and you don't even realize, I don't, that I'm automatically doing the thing that the impulse suggested. But in fact, we think our, it's we think we're not, but we are we are actually choosing in a way then, or it's just we automatic. sort of are. It's just that's a habit. That's the force of habit. But the truth is, in between the impulse and the response, is a gap, and that is a moment where we we might feel ourselves. We don't feel like it's very big, and so we just move into whatever the impulse suggested. But we can create more and more space in that gap, and we can invite God into that gap. Say, God, show me way, show me the way. How do I do this? We don't have to be slaves to our impulses. No. When you look at the life of Jesus, it sure looks like he knew something about this, doesn't it? I think so. I, 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 you know, it's hard to imagine what was actually going on in Jesus' brain at any one point of time, but he was fully human. He encountered all the things we encounter. That's important, because I think sometimes we think, don't we think, oh, he's Jesus. He just pulls the, the God card. But right. Scripture shows him in very real tough situations where he's got these same impulses, fully human in every way we are, and he's got to make these choices. Yeah, yeah. The temptation that's recorded in Matthew 4 shows him interacting in his thought life at some level with the potential of ideas that would have been very harmful to him and to his purposes. And instead, we see him choose not to go in the direction of that idea. And I have to say, well, that's kind of what we're talking about here. He had an idea that was planted there, we, say, we know, by the enemy of his soul and ours, and he chose a different way. He entertained an idea and did a different thing, and that's what's available to us. And the thing that came in, that he invited into that gap was what? It was scripture. It was scripture. It was yep. the truth of who God is and the presence yep. of his Father with him in that moment. Yep. So much to learn there. So let's, yeah, let's take all Good. this. Yeah. I know you want to hear more about neuroplasticity. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but let's take all this brain science and, and McLaren talk and let's try to put it on and, yeah. and apply it to our, our habits that we're focusing on this week, which is worry and complaining. Let's dive, maybe you want to define some terms here. What do, what do you think of when you think of worry? I think worry is when we're constantly mulling over a potential negative outcome in the future. Right? That's sort of a street-level definition of worry. Mm. We keep thinking about it over and over again. I wake up in the middle of the night. What if work doesn't go well? What if I don't hit my goals for the quarter for this you know, sales quota? What if, I don't, uh, what if my son is still uh, playing video games in my basement when he's 41 years old? <laughs> like, what, what if? You know, what if my toddler doesn't get potty trained? What if my neighbor cuts the big tree in the backyard that I really like. Like we can come up, I can come up with all kinds of things to actually worry about. And that causes these neural pathways to be wired into deep negativity. There's, there's a lot of studies being done right now suggesting that a lot of us are worrying more. We were already kind of worriers, and, but now everyone's worrying about everything to a higher degree, and which of course feeds into the complaining we'll get to, but you know, if I've got money, I worry about losing it. If I don't have money, I worry that I don't have enough. If I'm old, I worry about dying. If I'm young, I worry about life. And I mean, it's just there's no end to it. And um, it's, it's, I think of that proverb, uh, Proverb 12, 25 says, worry just weighs a person down. So I want to invite you to be personal about this right now and to think not about someone else but your own self and the kind, of, the kind of worry that you're feeling when Mindy just listed all those examples. Um, like some of you are like, well, I was feeling great until I came in and she gave me some 10 things to worry about. But, <laughs> but I think there's a lot, there is a lot. And, and COVID seems like it has exacerbated the problem, wouldn't you agree? I would totally agree. I remember April of last year like taking screenshots of how many deaths had happened each day and watching and we would we would see that we all saw the news and we all saw the things that were so worrisome and in the middle of the night we're wondering can I smell anymore do I have a fever like we would just I would just be worrying a lot and then social media was not my friend in that time and you've maybe heard this term that I think was invented in COVID but this idea of doom scrolling where we just keep the the feed of our of our social media we just keep looking at what are more and more traumatizing headlines. What terrible thing is happening around the world? What terrible thing is happening in another part of the country? 
And all the algorithms now we're realizing of those social media companies, I mean, they're just oh, feeding you more dramatic stuff. I'll send 10 more <laughs> worrisome articles to you. Every time you click on negative bad news, you signed up for 10 more articles. Well, and part of the reason, this is a little side note, part of the reason scrolling works so well for us and when they invented that, if you ever wondered, like, why do all these social media things f go by scrolling? One of the big things that your brain gets addicted to is the dopamine that is released when there's something novel, novelty, something new. And so when you realize you're just, you just keep wanting to refresh, you want to see what's new. And your mind, it doesn't care if it's good news or bad news, it's just new. And so your brain is wired to keep sucking that information in. And there's a lot of bad news that we worry about. Yep. It reminds me of... Um Corey Ten Boom, who of course survived mm. abhorrent um, conditions in Holocaust Germany, is the one who said, worry doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrow, it empties today of its strength. Wow. And you know, that, that to, me, to me sums it up. We'll come back to worry in a minute. What about complaining? Wow. What do you think of when you think of complaining? Yeah, yeah. Complaining I think of as like constantly reiterating something that you don't like in your current circumstances constantly going back to naming the thing you don't like that's terrible. Uh, my husband said, well, if you want any advice on complaining, you can certainly talk to me. I told you earlier. <laughs> <laughs> my husband one year, uh, I didn't realize it at first, for Lent, I don't know if you guys yeah. experienced Lent here, but we, he had given up complaining for Lent. And I didn't know that for the first like few weeks. Um, but man, it was awesome. Like I could tell a big difference. He just literally wasn't complaining. It was, he did a really good job until Easter Sunday. Can I tell you Easter Sunday, we are walking out of church. He has been released from the, the obligation of Lent and somebody had slighted him in the lobby of the church in a way that he didn't appreciate it. And he starts complaining about this person on the way to the car. And I'm like, wait, what? What is going on? Don't go back before. to it. <laughs> Don't go back to it. Yeah, but so it's a constant conversation in our house about complaining, but it's easy. It's easy. It's a conversation starter. Oh, oh, the weather's so bad. The, the Orioles stink, mm -hmm. you know, or whatever. You know, the Ravens are, or we complain about things. It's a conversation starter. We think we're building a bridge. And we think it doesn't have any long-term impact. But every time we give voice to something negative like that, we are just laying down these pathways in our brain and occupying mind space that could be devoted to other things. We are robbing our creativity, we're robbing our joy, we're robbing our ability to connect deeply with other people. It really, there is a cost to all this complaining. I just want to say, I, I think, I was kind of very convicted about this, and I, I think I'm probably one of those people that has no idea how much I subtly complain. I don't want to be a negative person, but I can find I can find a dark cloud behind every silver lining if I work at it, especially when I'm not really walking closely with the Lord, mm. when I'm kind of just not as close to the Lord as I could be. Mm. That's when I get a little more like, uh, yeah, and I, and I think a lot of people who complain, maybe this is you or someone you love, aren't aware because we justified. It's like, I'm not complaining. I'm just the world is so stupid, I'm just commenting on how bad the world is. It's not me that's complaining. <laughs> See what I mean? It's like I don't think we, we realize that. And um, that critical moaning and groaning and griping and all of that can become a way of life. I love what Psychology Today said. It said that some people are optimists and they see the glass half full. There are some people who are pessimists and they see the glass half empty. And then there are the chronic sort of complainers who see that the glass is slightly chipped. And it's actually holding water that is lukewarm, which is especially annoying since I asked for chilled and bottled sparkling Perrier, and you know, which reminds me there is a smudge on the rim, which means I didn't even wash the glass properly, which probably means I'll catch a virus, which means I'm going to get sick. Why does this always happen to me? I'm having such a bad year. All from a glass of water. You see, and, and you know, it's not about the glass at that yep. point. It's about yep. me, isn't it? And, and, I, and I, think, I think that response, it reminds me of someone who said, uh, you know, um, Complaining is like vomiting. Paul Molitor used to play for the twins. Complaining is like vomiting. You know, it makes me feel better in the moment, but it makes everyone else around me sick. <laughs> and that's kind, of, that's kind of how it is. So just, I mean, be honest with yourself. How would people around you 
Hmm. Talk about you, you know, like, do they, or, or they, have they just gotten used to the fact that you're a complainer? This is really, really important. And so how, what are, what's a pathway out of this? How can we start rewiring our brains and yeah, responding yeah. differently? Well, my husband's example is one of them, just to start noticing and saying, I'm not going to do that anymore. Uh, but if you can't go quite cold turkey, I did read of a great other way to address the habit of complaining. And it's to, when you notice yourself complaining, immediately, like, make your choice ahead of time. Every time I complain, I'm going to also express gratitude for something. So it becomes a trigger for gratitude. Every time you notice yourself complaining, oh, man, I'm so annoyed about the neighbor. They're going to cut down that tree. Okay, and I'm really grateful for this neighborhood that we live in. There's some of our best friends we've ever had are in this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Or I'm complaining about somebody at work that just is in, you know, they're insensitive. They're always talking too loud in meetings and it's annoying. Okay, so I complained about that. And I'm so grateful I have this job. And these people provide some great community for me that matters. Or the work we do is meaningful. So do you get that idea? Like you just have to, every time you cut yourself complaining, also commit to giving something you're grateful for. And it actually can arrest it, and then over time you actually start anticipating the gratitude and going, eh, maybe I won't bother with a complaint, I'll just stay in gratitude. So all of that leads us to, to what scripture holds out as this, this state of mind and being that God invites us mm. to. Tell us kind of yeah. how oh. scripture invites us to live. Yeah, again, this is so much where we see, and, and as you read the Bible more and more, you'll see examples of this. In the, in the uh, prophet Isaiah, uh, chapter 26 and verse 3, Isaiah tells us, well, God tells us, that God will keep us in what he calls perfect peace. And the Hebrew is actually shalom, shalom, the idea of flourishing the most flourishing version of flourishing. Shalom, shalom. God will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in him. And that is a... Incredible what does it mean? To have a steadfast mind. Yeah. I want. I want that shalom, that deep, yes. connected peace. Right. Yep. What does it mean to have a steadfast mind? Or- One of the things that your mind has the ability to do. Back to this this minute window of not a minute, but like seconds of window of choice is we can decide what to set our minds on. And periodically throughout the scripture, we're encouraged to place our minds on certain things. Choose what to think about. Choose to place your mind. And when we do that, especially placing it onto the person of God, which even if you're beginning a relationship with God, you're still learning. When you're feeling worried to choose to place your mind onto God, the idea of God, he begins to protect us from all those worries. Mm. It's a supernatural reality, but he does keep us in perfect peace. Even if the circumstances around us are incredibly painful and hard, we can still encounter this perfect peace. Mm. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that sound good? Mm. Philippians 4, um, at the end of chapter 4, middle of chapter 4, he says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble... Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. The part of your brain that chooses what to focus on, that's the stuff to focus on. Then it ends by saying, um, and the God of peace, shalom, will be with you. That's pretty, pretty powerful. Now, Jesus had a lot to say about this very thing. Um, take us, take us. Uh, yeah, through. yeah. Uh, and one of the things we're gonna, I'm gonna read over us um, some of Jesus's words at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. So one of his most famous messages. And what I love about this is he doesn't like kind of beat us up for the fact that we worry. He understands that we worry, right? And he's inviting us into choosing not to worry. He understands we're gonna worry. But listen to the words of Jesus. You, might, you can watch these along the side screens or you might want to just shut your eyes and, and listen to the words of Jesus. And think of it as an invitation. What is Jesus' invitation to you? That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. These are things we all worry about. Jesus says, don't worry about whether you have enough food and drink. Don't worry about the clothes to wear. 
Isn't your life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at birds. They don't plant or harvest or store their food away in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add even one moment to your life? And why do you worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, and yet Solomon, King Solomon, in all his glory, was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown in the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do we have such little faith? So don't worry about these things, saying what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of those who don't believe. But your heavenly Father knows, already knows, all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So, in conclusion, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Man, I just think that's the stuff we worry about. Food, we worry about what we're going to eat, what we're going to wear. I mean, it almost tomorrow, sounds... Tomorrow, what if, what yeah, if not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is beautiful, and, you know, it, it, he's also reminding us that, you know, worry doesn't actually accomplish anything. You know, we think we're helping someone or ourselves, but he's like, nope. you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, you know. It's like, remember Bombeck said, it's like a rocking chair. It's like, worry's like a rock. It gives you something to do, but you never get anywhere. <laughs> and, and there's a lot of truth that we're stewing without doing, and, and, yeah. and there's, there's a beautiful thing to say, it's about trust in God, ultimately. Yeah. And the more that Jesus is the Lord of my life in a certain area, the less worry I have in that area. If he's not the Lord of my life in my finances, I'm going to worry about my finances. If he's not the Lord of my life in my family, I'm going to worry more about my kids. Mm -hmm. But the more that I tr trust God in every area of my life, the less worry I will do, which kind of leads us to prayer, yeah. which is where Scripture ultimately says, in that moment when you're tempted to worry, that thing comes in, gets in your brain, we, you, what's your phrase you say if you can meditate? How does that go? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you know how to worry, you know how to meditate. <laughs> Sometimes we wonder, like, how do we meditate? The, the scriptures tell us, you know, meditate on God's goodness. Meditate on who God's character is. There are ways to set your mind on really valuable, life-giving things. And the, the good news is if you know how to worry, you know how to meditate. You know how to take an idea and look at it from one angle and another angle and again and look at it from all the different sides over and over and over again. That's what meditation is. Only instead of thinking about what could go wrong, you're thinking about God's power and his goodness, his love. Well, what does that look like from this angle and from this angle and from this angle? Mm -hmm. That's what meditation can be. Taking my thoughts Godward in mm -hmm. that moment. So Philippians 4, verses we've used a lot at Mountain in recent months. Chapter 4, verse 6 and 7 says, hmm. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and mm -hmm. petition, with thanksgiving, mm -hmm. present your requests to God. And then it says this, the peace of God, which transcends our understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It's a picture of how peace is so strong like a bodyguard, like a sentry at the door of your brain. When a thought wants to come in and just invade your brain space and worry, it's like, no, I'm going to first present my request to God with some gratitude and thankfulness mm -hmm. in there. And then the peace of God just stands guard at your brain when that thought wants to come in and it says, nope, yep. not going to happen here. Yep. But it starts with us presenting our request to God and turning over to the Lord the yes. very things that maybe we're most tempted uh, to worry about. So let's wrap this up, Mindy. Mm -hmm. If Can you help us with some practical stuff that we can take out of here uh, in our, uh, this time together? It's like something we can sink our teeth into and walk yeah. out of here and put in our shoes. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I think one of the most important and first things is you can learn to become aware of what you're thinking about. 
Okay. You can start to notice what you're noticing. Pay attention to what thoughts are Think going about on. what I'm thinking about. Yeah, think about what you're thinking yeah. about. Sometimes you do that in the pages of a journal, like reflect back on the day before, what things op- what were things were dominating my headspace? What does that look like? Um, but those, that's a really important first step. If you're like, I don't, I don't know if I'm worrying or not. Well, start paying attention, start noticing. Mm-hmm. Uh, another super practical thing, and it, it, again, it may seem a little effusive, but it gets super practical, is to learn to set your mind on the reality, on the person of God. Choose, make that chooser part of your brain, choose to think about the reality of God in the midst of your circumstances. Now, this is really important for us. I'm not in any way suggesting there's some sort of Pollyanna, like everything is happy and good all the time. I just don't even think about the bad things anymore. I just kind of block it and go think about God. That, that would be a bad idea, right? Like one of the most important things we need to do is engage in what's real. We need to understand what's real. We need to let the data in of our circumstances. Feel some bad feelings. Sometimes that's involved. Sadness, right? sorrow, anger can be part of this, but... Totally, but the, we, we experience that, we take that in, we take that information in, and we choose to connect with God right then and right there. And as we do, that guard gets put up in place in our mind, and we're able to better experience hope in the midst of really hard things. This is a really hard one for me. I was telling Mindy earlier, I don't like to feel bad stuff. I don't even like to feel stuff sometimes. I just want to keep going. It's, a, it's kind of inconvenient sometimes yep. to have to stop and be sad or have to think about stuff. Anybody relate to that? So I'm, when I set my mind on God, I'm, I'm, invite, I'm mindful. Yep. I'm thinking about what really is going on. What am I happy or sad about? Inviting Jesus into that because even in the middle of the pain, I cling to the hope. Yes. And this is a way to rewire our brains. It really rather than does. escaping, rather than what, ignoring, I'm, I'm okay. So yeah, absolutely. One Another one is uh, the advice uh, from that author and the things my husband had done. It really can, you can use your complaints to, when you find yourself complaining, to trigger gratitude, to choose to be grateful right in that moment. As soon as you notice you're complaining, let that become an opportunity to actually express gratitude. So I have a temptation to, let's do this right now, okay? Let's do this together right now. Um, Maybe we think about just, uh, this will be fun, think about something you most often, or maybe you're thinking about complaining about right now, okay? (laughs) But that thing that, that you maybe are most prone to complain about, right? It might be about work or... Could it be a relationship that you always complain about? It's something your mother always does a thing, like whatever it is. Could be about yourself, something about yourself that you are really down on yourself for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's All right, it's, now what? We're, yeah. We got that part down. You got it? Something you're ready to complain about. All right, now what? All right, now just open the aperture of your brain a little bit, your mind, and say, what can I be grateful for in the middle of that circumstance? In that very thing? Yes, no, right there. It doesn't have to, like, they don't cancel each other out. There may still be a thing that's hard, but learn to look for the silver lining. Look for the where is there good in this particular circumstance. Give us an example. Oh, let's say, okay, uh, a lot of folks, um, I think a lot of us complain uh, inwardly about even our own selves. I don't, I don't measure up to some ideal that exists out in the world. And every time I look in the mirror or I look at my bank account or I look at my driveway, I don't measure up and I want to complain about that. Instead of, oh, my, my body is healthy. I can still breathe. I can still relate to people that I love. Or maybe it's a circumstance that, you know, your spouse has a annoying habit and you want to complain about that because it's so annoying and you shouldn't have to deal with it. Well, wait, what am I grateful for in this relationship? That is so much of a blessing. And how do I give voice to that instead? If I do that once, I might be able to do it twice. And if I do it twice, I could do it three times. It could become a new pattern, a new habit for me. One more. Another example? No, one more. One more uh, way. Help. This is a, a very, very practical thing. Uh, I, you said you tend to think about complaining. I am more of a worrier. And for me, this was one of the most helpful practices to combat worrying in a work relationship that I have had. And it was to uh, recognize that the thought to worry could be a trigger for a spiritual practice called a breath prayer. 
And a breath prayer is basically the idea of a, a, a simple prayer that you could pray as easily as with your breath and as often as you breathe. And the one that was introduced to me was that I could start when I was worried to say this simple, Jesus, I belong to you. Jesus, I belong to you. And then my head would go further into the worry and it's like, no, Jesus, I belong to you. And that's just a very simple example of a breath prayer that you can take with you and use as often as you need to. And it's significant because it's not just like a, a phrase that's important to say, and there could be value in that, but in, in prayer, you're actually engaging God. You're actually talking, Jesus, I belong to you. Another common breath prayer that has been used throughout the history of the church is, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And so maybe there's a circumstance in your life that you're returning to worry or to complaining, and you could instead choose a breath prayer. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. So that's how we're going to close. We're going to give ourselves mm -hmm. some space to be with God, and you have an opportunity to breathe the prayer to the Lord. Reminder that Philippians says... Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with some thanks, present your request to God. And that's where the peace comes in to guard our hearts. So we're going to mm. present our request to God mm. and kind of hold him to his end of the bargain and invite him to bring his peace as we bring our requests through a simple breath prayer. So we'll just take a little bit of, of a moment to, to be silent uh, together for just a little while. Okay, at all of our campuses and online, wherever you are, if you're driving, you don't have to close your eyes. Uh, but, uh, you know, let's just, let's give some space for this and maybe call to mind that one thing. How would you, how would you set this up as we get yeah, ready to pray for, this Yeah, for me, what I would love for you guys to all do right now is think about the thing that you, that you're most worried about, that most troubles you. And then specifically see if you can find a way to just talk honestly with God. doesn't need to be fancy words or anything, but just like my request, God, would be fill in the blank. What is your request? And that's as simple as whatever that is. We're going to leave it silent for you for a moment. What is the request that you could, and it could be vulnerable, that you are vulnerable you want to bring to God? And the, the scripture doesn't tell us that God will do everything you want him to do. He's not like a magic genie in the sky. What he does, what he promises to do, is when we bring him our requests, he will bring that guard to your mind. Yes. He will bring that protection to your headspace. And that's really, really important for us. So we're going to take time. I'll be quiet in a, a moment, minute. We'll be quiet. Mindy, will you close us yeah. in, in, in Would a, love to. audible prayer in just a moment? Love Let's to. Let's pray together, everyone. God, in this space, I just assume that some of us are talking to you about dear relationships or loved ones who are ill or financial worries. And God, we just thank you that you invite us, you explicitly invite us to bring these to you. So tonight we're bringing you our concerns. We are making our requests known to you. And God, we are so grateful for the promise in your word that you will respond with guardianship over our minds. God, we, we desire to experience that peace. Help train us, retrain us on how to bring these requests to you as often as we start to feel the temptation to worry or complain. We want to be frequent requesters and those who experience your peace. And we pray this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Amen. We show our appreciation to Mindy for being with us. Thank mm. you so much. Thank you. My joy. Thank you. Thank you, guys. God bless.